Hi, this is Sherry Lagoon. I am one of the lung transplant coordinators. I'm going to be discussing the transplant episode with you today. I want to discuss with you um, the process of called the call, what to do, what to bring to the hospital when the transplant coordinator calls you and tells you that the uh, transplant surgeon on call as well as the pulmonologist on call um, has accepted lungs and you're ready for transplant. Uh, one of the first things to remember is not to eat or drink anything except any medications that you may have to do with a sip of water except for any type of anticoagulant like aspirin, Flavix, and if you have any doubts, um, please go over it with your transplant coordinator when they call. Uh, bring your medication list uh, and enough oxygen to get to the hospital and return home in the case where the lungs may not be acceptable for transplant. When you come to the hospital, you will be arriving either to the hospital uh, main admitting department, that is in, located in the front door to the hospital, um, or to the emergency room entrance. You're not going to be admitted to the emergency room. That's just where admitting is after hours. Your transplant coordinator that calls you will direct you to either location. Those are the only two entrances that you will be asked to go to. Um, and as you arrive uh, to either location, if you would immediately ask for oxygen upon your arrival so that you could save your, your oxygen, uh, that would be very helpful. And if for any reason, if you're running late, either caught up in the emergency room area or late in the traffic, please notify your transplant coordinator. She or he are the ones coordinating the transplant and the amount of time that you originally told them that it would take for you to get to the hospital is very important. So if you deviate from that, please notify them immediately. Upon arrival to the hospital, you will already have a reserved bed. Uh, you will be admitted to that area. A nurse will come in and go through the admitting process with you. Um, one of the transplant pulmonologists will greet you. If not, when you get there shortly thereafter, they will go through anything, answer any questions that you may have, and go through the entire transplant process with you. You will go to pre-op holding uh, prior to going to the operating room for your surgery. During what we call the pre-op test, which is prior to transplant, we will draw labs, several different tubes of blood, urine sample will be obtained, we will do a chest x-ray, an EKG, and any preliminary medications or preparatory medications such as antibiotics and your first dose of immunosuppression therapy will be given to you at that time and that will be prior to surgery. As far as how long you will wait uh, for surgery, um, it's difficult to determine for various reasons. There may be delays on the donor hospital side of things or on the Tampa General Hospital side of things with weather changes, operating room schedules, traumas at the donor facility. So just be prepared to wait. Try to be patient and your coordinator will keep you updated as to what is happening. Um, occasionally um, you will be rushed to the pre-op area and immediately go to the operating room. So there are a lot of variables to consider and a lot of unknowns. One of the most important terms you'll learn in the transplant process is visualization. Uh, visualization is the point at which the transplant process in which the coordinator is notified that the lung or lungs are good or not suitable for transplant. That is after the transplant surgeon and the transplant team that goes to procure the lungs have visually inspected the lungs from the outside as well as the inside of the donor. And if they're not suitable, then you will be discharged um, with your own oxygen to go home and we will continue to keep you active on the transplant list in the hopes of getting you transplanted very quickly. The dry run is an episode when you're brought to the hospital for transplant and the lungs are deemed not suitable and therefore you are not transplanted at that time. This can occur prior to or after you go to the pre-op area or surgical suite. Um, Please know that it is a possibility and a potential part of the transplant process and frequently happens. Lungs are very fragile and it's not uncommon to have at least one dry run during your time on the transplant list. Uh, the bright side is that you can get called at any time and that you may have more than one dry run. Uh, the most important thing to remember is that we are seeking perfect lungs for you. 
pre-op holding is an area where you'll meet anesthesia um, many times. The uh, anesthesiologist and the nurse anesthetist will interview you there to get an idea of your history. Remember, they're meeting you for the first time uh, and just getting ready to move back to the actual surgical um, room. Your family will be allowed to stay with you in that area, providing everything has been finished and you're just waiting to go back to the, to the actual operating room itself. Um, at that time, when you are moving to the operating room, your family will then be directed to the waiting area. Once you're admitted to the pre-op area, various things happen. For example, a lot of times you'll be introduced to the anesthesia team. Uh, they'll ask you a lot of questions that you've already answered uh, previously for your pulmonologist and or your cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, and they're just doing their part in order to prepare to put you to sleep. Uh, you'll meet various members of their team. Many times they will do different types of uh, intravenous lines that are placed for use um, while you're in the operating room and after um, you come out of the operating room that help the nurses and, and doctors give you medication. Um, sometimes you may, as a lung transplant patient, um, it is difficult for you to lay flat. Sometimes this step will be skipped and you'll be go to the operating rooms and be put to sleep and then they'll put the lines in there. Um, a lot of it depends on the schedule as far as how soon your new lungs will arrive and how well you can breathe at the time. Um, once you get back to the operating room, you'll meet the surgical team and then they're going to be preparing to get you actually ready for the event of the surgery itself. The surgery itself can take anywhere from 4 to 10 hours depending on whether you are having a single or a double lung transplant. And it may take longer depending on if you've had previous surgery in the chest, either lung or heart surgery, that would have developed scar tissue. Um, this is also a consideration if you have a, a diagnosis or a pulmonary diagnosis that results in having scar tissue related to your lungs. It may be more difficult to remove them and take longer. Uh, surgery will not actually begin when you go to the pre-op holding area, so your family member should not stop, start the clock immediately. There's a lot of preparation processes, probably prepping and draping, and anesthesia will have to put you to sleep, and if you need lines at that time, sometimes it can be up to an hour to an hour and a half where the surgery actually starts. Um, after the surgery is completed, the surgeon will come out and speak with your family and let them know if they have any particular concerns or if your surgery went well, if it did not, what they're concerned about. And during that time, uh, the operating room team is preparing you to be transferred um, to the cardiac surgical ICU where you'll be recovered. There are two types of incisions used for lung transplant. Uh, both of them are referred to as thoracotomies. One happens on the front side of the body, and that's referred to as a clamshell, and that's done just under the breast line of the front of the body. Um, the other type is called lateral thoracotomy, and that is done um, in the area of the scapula on the back, um, depending on the side that you need the lung transplanted on. If you need a right thoracotomy or a right lung transplant, you'll have a right thoracotomy, and the same goes for the left side. During the immediate post-op period, meaning the, the period right after surgery, um, visiting hours will not be allowed um, until after the patient has been out of surgery for at least 24 hours, and that is due to the uh, potential for infection. A family will be allowed to see um, their loved one behind the glass of the sliding glass doors to reassure them that the patient has actually made it through surgery and to see that they're doing well. Um, in the first 24 hours, um, intubation, um, and that is where the tube is into uh, through the mouth, into the throat, and into the lungs to assist the patient in breathing until all the vital organs stabilize themselves. We will work on having that removed or the process we call extubation within the first 24 hours. Also pain control is a lot of what we're doing at this point in time. We will keep um, the patient sedated until it's time to take that tube out or extubate them. Um, and then will be a good time for family and friends to come and 
um, gown, glove, mask, and will be allowed to sit in the patient's room, assist them with anything that they may want to, to visit with them, occupy them, have discussions, conversations with them. Um, your loved one may still be a little bit drowsy or a little bit groggy, but will very quickly, in a short period of time, be back to themselves. The CVICU is what we refer to as the cardiovascular intensive care unit, and that is where all transplant patients go to be recovered. Um, we do not use a recovery room. The actual nurses in that unit recover the patient after surgery and follow along with them until they're stable enough to be transferred out of that unit and go to a private room on the floor. While the patient is in the CVICU, um, you can expect uh, most patients wake up in about 2 to 10 hours after the surgery. Uh, the breathing tube or the um, ET or endotracheal tube must remain in place until we're sure that everything is stabilized, all the vital organs and the patient is doing well and is prepared to have that tube come out. During that time, they'll be connected to the ventilator or the breathing machine that takes care of assisting in ventilation until the patient can resume breathing on their own. Um, that tube will be removed as soon as possible, but again, we have to wait until everything has stabilized and we know all the other organ systems are reacting favorably to this big surgery that's just taken place. And during this time, the patient can write notes and communicate with their family. While you're in the CVICU, you will have a nasogastric tube, also referred to as an NG tube, that will be in your nose and it goes into the stomach and it allows fluid and, fluids and gastric acids to be emptied. Uh, it will also be removed when you can drink and when you're awake. Uh, a lot of this is also to protect your airway. A Foley catheter will be placed in your bladder to measure your urinary output and it will be removed as soon as you're able to get up to the bedside commode to empty your bladder, and usually that is within the first several days. Large IVs will be placed in your neck and arm to administer medications and draw blood, and you also will have restraints that are gently tied to your hands to prevent you from pulling or dislodging the breathing tube or any other tubes or IVs accidentally. You will also have chest tubes that are in place to drain blood and fluids from the chest cavity, and this is to prevent infection. They will also remove when the drains stop draining, and the JP drains will remain in place. And the JP drains are short for Jackson Pratt, and those drains are in place between the chest wall and the skin, and that is also to remove fluid and blood uh, and to prevent infection. The, the length of stay in the CVICU is an average of three to seven days, uh, and that is based on the amount of care that you need. So the sooner that you're independent and moving along and several milestones have been met, you're eligible to move to a, a private room. Um, you must be able to uh, transfer to the transplant floor when you have all of your chest tubes removed. And there may be as many as four chest tubes if you have two lungs. You'll have two chest tubes in the front and two chest tubes in the back. If you have one lung, then you will have two chest tubes, one in the front and one in the back. A uh, breathing tube has been removed, and you're breathing well on your own. And your physical ability to get out of the bed with minimal assistance has been obtained. And as you know, that we have always been talking to you about being able to transfer without the use of your arms from a sitting position from the bed to the bedside commode, from the recliner to the bed, and that is the importance of this exercise that we have given you to do. Your daily activities will range from physical therapy uh, with a physical therapist, uh, occupational therapy, pulmonary rehabilitation therapy, speech therapy, and this is to um, observe for any type of swallowing problems that you might have and doing swallowing studies to make sure that you can swallow the massive amount of medications that you'll be taking as well as food and nutrition that you're going to need to be able to swallow without problems. Uh, monitoring of fluid intake and output is very important, um, and the nurses will do that. They'll be measuring everything that goes in and everything that comes out to make sure that we 
have a, a good um, hydration status. The NG tube, chest tubes, IVs, urine output will all be measured. Uh, nutrition, a tube feed or increase in diet after the swallowing studies has, have taken place. When we make sure that you can swallow without any difficulties and all of the nasogastric tubes are out, your diet will be advanced. Uh, transplant pulmonologists will see you each day, usually very early in the morning, um, and you should write down any questions that you or your family may have as the day go, as you go through the day, and keep them at your bedside, keep them recorded, so when your transplant pulmonologist comes in, you have them available, and, and they are there to ask them, answer them at that time. Um, this is particularly helpful if you have a loved one that wants to stay with you. It's not a requirement, but if they stay with you, then they also will have an opportunity to ask their questions in the morning when the physician is there as well. There will be an increase in activity, deep breathing, coughing, and pain control and they're evaluated on a daily basis as well. Uh, we'll be pushing you very hard, you'll be very busy, and you won't have much time to be sitting around or sleeping. We want to really get you back to being able to be up most of the time like you would be at home. Um, they'll also be continuously monitoring your vital signs while all of these activities are taking place. As far as pain management goes, um, we have found in our program that people that have their pain managed um, do significantly better with increase in movement. Increase in movement helps the lungs to get stronger and do better, and it also helps you to be able to get closer to going home. The most important thing is that we stay ahead of your pain, and we want to do that by making sure that you're that we relieve the pain before it's so bad that you feel like you cannot do anything except laying in bed. There's a variety of pain medications um, and applications that we use to do this with. You may be on a pump that um, we administer intravenous pain medications with and you use the button when you feel that you need to have a little bit of medication and that's self-administered. That is done for severe pain. It doesn't remain in place for very long, only as you need it. Um, we also uh, use pain medications um, orally with tablets and we have stronger medications that we use for severe pain and a milder tablet medication we use for milder pain. We think it's very important um, that you convey your pain level to your nurses and physicians so that we know how to best treat you, how to keep you comfortable. We are not going to allow you to become addicted to narcotics or any type of pain medication, so you should not be hesitant to ask for it because it will make your overall experience and recovery a much faster one. And a faster recovery holds down on any type of um, potential bad outcomes like infections, um, anything that you can do to make your stay in the hospital shorter is to your advantage. Part of the education that you'll receive um, is deep breathing and coughing. Deep breathing may be difficult for you to do because of your incision and your muscle weakness. Uh, we'll show you how to splint your chest with a pillow and you'll actually receive a, a pillow that are shape, in the shape of lungs um, and we will teach you how to use that. This is a very important exercise so it's not to be minimized. Um, coughing uh, is very important because the nerves are severed during your surgery and therefore you've lost your cough reflex. For this reason, it's very important that you form a habit of purposefully coughing to clear any secretions that might be pulling in your lungs. These secretions could lead to potential infection. And remember, these are your new lungs, so you need to pay, take care of them as much as possible. Um, we will also encourage you and prompt you um, on how to do this, but this is going to be one of the most difficult things you do as well as the most important things you do. Um, and that leads me to talking to you about your pain medication again. We find that people that are not in severe pain can perform this exercise in a more useful manner and that's why it's very important that you have enough pain medication um, on board that you're able to do this as effectively as possible. Some common concerns that we want to bring to your attention while you're in the CVICU and may even extend to after you are in your private room up on the, on the unit is lack of sleep. Uh, very common in the ICU setting or any setting at which your normal sleep pattern has been interrupted. You may experience confusion, 
um, as to whether it's day or night or just confusion in general. Um, and you should always ask your physician to let them know if you need help sleeping or if you're having difficulties processing any information um, or feel confused or foggy or anything like that. It's important that your doctor be aware of that. You may experience hallucinations or strange dreams and this be can be caused by a syndrome called ICU psychosis and that is a fancy word for lack of sleep um, and that's due to medications, um, over stimulus of all the constant noise, the lack of windows or really being able to know if it's day or night or what we call interruption of our circadian rhythm that we all have um, when we're not in the hospital um, and that will cause some of these symptoms and they are easily eliminated and they will also go away once your normal um, day and night routine is established. Um, please let your physician know again if you're experiencing any of these symptoms so that he can be aware of it and can also help help you through this process. Once you have been um, extubated or the breathing tube removed, your chest tubes removed, it, it usually is determined that you're stable enough to go to a, a transplant area um, that is non-critical care. Um, those arrangements will be made and you will go to 7A2, 8A, or 8A2. Those are the units that most common take care of transplant patients and are very aware and used to taking care of patients with the types of problems and concerns that you'll experience. Upon arrival to the transplant court, you'll begin to learn about your medications, receive diabetic education. Um, if you if your steroids that you're taking for anti-rejection have caused your blood sugar to go up, we'll treat you as if you're a diabetic. Uh, we'll review any teaching materials given to you uh, by your transplant coordinator. Um, this is the time that you will receive a pharmacy education class as well as the discharge teaching class you need to now go home with your new lungs. Those classes are made by appointment and your support team will need to be able to be there and you need to pass a test um, in order to deem you acceptable to go home with your new lungs. There's a series of tasks that need to be accomplished um, before you are prepared for discharge um, and they're broken up into two categories uh, for the patient standpoint and from the support person standpoint. From a patient standpoint, you need to be able to administer your program. That is one of the anti-rejection medications that you will be on. You also need to be able to demonstrate that you can record vital signs appropriately in the proper location of the book, that notebook that will be supplied for you. Um, you will also need to demonstrate on your new microspirometry, that is your own um, individual machine, that you can effectively perform that activity and record the numbers appropriately. Uh, diabetic education will need to be done and you will need to demonstrate your ability to check your blood sugar and administer insulin if it is indicated that you need to do this from a blood sugar standpoint. Um, you will need to accomplish your medication education class and be familiar with your pills and be able to identify them and also be able to prepare the medication box by filling your medications in the appropriate location. And you also will have a bronchoscopy and the first biopsy um, that you will have done in the hospital. Your JP or Jackson Pratt drains must be removed and a test will be given to you by the physician and coordinator that you must pass successfully. For your support person, they must also be able to administer the program and coach the patient as to properly administering their program. Um, they must be able to record vital signs as well. They must be familiar with all diabetic, diabetic education received by the patient as well as being able to check a blood sugar and or get insulin if necessary. Um, and then they must also be able to um, complete the post-education education class. That includes any test that would be given. They must also pass this test successfully. Um, they must attend the medication education class and also be able to complete filling the med box appropriately prior to being discharged from the hospital.
This may seem like a lot of information. It's very important that you review this information with you and your support team on more than one occasion. We hope that by prompting you and educating you on the various things that you'll be asked to uh, demonstrate and participate in after transplant, that it will provide you with an overall much more satisfactory and quick recovery while you're in the hospital.